Welcome to Galesburg Nazarene uh, Wednesday time of Bible study and prayer. Uh, today is February 15th, 2023. And my name is Judy, and uh, it's still winter outside, a little bit uh, chilly out there. Um, but we welcome those who are watching from home, and uh, we appreciate you listening. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for another day in the presence of you in our lives. We thank you that you reached out to us through Christ and that because of him and his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension that he sits at the right hand of you, Lord, that we can come before you and pray and ask for wisdom and discernment. And so tonight we ask that you would just bless our time, bless our time as we open up the word of God and learn from you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So welcome to our time of uh, Bible study and prayer. Um, we just completed last week uh, a study of Jesus' parables in the Gospel of Luke. We didn't do all of them, uh, but we did a, a huge chunk of them. And this week we are going to be delving into a series on prayer. Um, prayer is a topic that I enjoy talking about. And prayer um, is both easy and hard at the same time. It's easy to come before God to let him know what our needs are, to communicate with him. But then there are times where finding the time to pray, um, especially for those things outside of our personal needs, uh, sometimes it's easier to pray about ourselves, but as we go outside of our own needs, finding that time to pray uh, can become difficult. But really, uh, prayer is the cornerstone of our relationship with God because and that's not, that shouldn't be surprising to anybody because communication is the basis for any relationship, uh, let alone the creator of the universe. We do need to communicate to have a relationship. Um, many times we often view prayer as us talking to or with God. Um, but really, prayer is a two-way street, talking and listening. Uh, we're probably going to maybe get into more of what, what that listening is uh, later on in this study. Uh, but during... Um, during the, tonight, or today, we are going to delve into something rather deep with prayer, and that is fasting. Um, I don't, wouldn't normally jump into uh, something so uh, maybe heavy at the beginning, but uh, the reason I'm jumping into the deep end of the pool uh, right at the beginning is the timing of the study. Uh, we are heading into the pre-Easter time of the year. Um, uh, it is often marked by Lent, which is usually a, a Wednesday in late February, early March. Um, it's the 40 days before Easter. And so we're probably going to talk about Lent uh, next week. Um, I, I don't want to, uh, it's sometimes we view Lent as something that the Catholic Church emphasizes, but the concept behind Lent, the concept of self denial, is something brought out throughout the Bible. And so this week, uh, we begin with an understanding of fasting and how God can work in our lives with this practice. And the reason why we're going this way is because many times uh, both Protestants and Catholics choose to give something up during the Lenten season. And so maybe a little bit of background on fasting and self-denial and its impact on our prayer life. And in fact, our church for a whole decade, from 2010 to 2020, did a 40-day time of prayer and fasting in the early part of the year, mid-January uh, to late February. And it was very, it was a time of uh, a good spiritual reflection and growth in our church. And so there, there are some bases for looking into this. Um, you know, I know a lot of times maybe we'll, uh, our discussion will be maybe repetitive and what you already know, maybe we'll learn something. But let's look at what fasting is and isn't. Uh, fasting is a common practice that can be found in scripture. It's a voluntary abstinence of food or other treasured item for a specific amount of time or days. And its aim is to devote oneself to prayer and seeking God. It is not sacrifice alone, but it's also a time of adding more time in prayer and med meditation on the word of God. Because going without food alone is not concept of prayer and fasting. We do have the kind of the diet wave of intermittent fasting where people give up food for a period of time for health reasons. 
Um, this type of fasting isn't just an abstinence of something. It's adding to uh, our lives the, a prayer or more meditation and more devotion on God. Uh, it does have to be coupled with prayer to uh, talk about what we're talking about in terms of the Bible. And most people associate fasting with the removal of food, um, but it can be a specific food item, such as caffeine or sugar. Um, fasting can also include things like refraining from social media or television. Or uh, The idea is to give up something that would be hard to give up than to devote oneself to deeper prayer and Bible reading. Uh, as one's cravings or hunger tug at our being, it serves as a reminder to pray to lean into God for strength, and to help us understand our weaknesses. It also puts the spiritual realm on notice that we need business in bringing our prayers before God. Now, Jesus discussed fasting during his ministry time, and we find uh, a couple of verses in, the, in Matthew chapter 6, and, if, and this is the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6 uh, is part of the Sermon on the Mount, so we're going to be looking at a couple of scriptures where Jesus when, and it's, it's good to know that when he's talking to the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking not to do his, just disciples or the religious leaders, he's talking to the crowd. So this is what he's telling everybody. Um, he's giving some background on how we should pray and fast. But before we read the scriptures, um, just a little background on what fasting meant to those people back at that time. The religious leaders built up a tradition of fasting twice a week and making a show of it uh, in public. They would often make themselves look haggard and, um, you know, sackcloth. They would make themselves look bad so everybody knew that they were fasting. Um, and so then when they were in fasting, they would go into the public areas, such as the synagogue or the marketplace, and just stand there and pray. Just pray out loud and look forlorn because they wanted everybody to know that they were praying and fasting. Uh, so Jesus tells us in these verses a better way to meet God at his throne of grace. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, and verses 16 through 18. And this is Jesus talking. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. I find it interesting that he calls them hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites. He's again calling them hypocrites, too. For they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So Jesus was really countering what the, the cultural understanding of prayer and fasting was at that time, especially with the Jewish people. And so uh, I guess people just assumed that, you know, that was just the way it was done but these people really got their reward. Um, now these scriptures do not say that corporate prayer, that is prayer in church or other group settings is inappropriate when Jesus says go to your prayer closet. It's addressing the hypocritical and empty prayers that so many of the Jewish people did in the public forums. Prayer was something that they were doing to impress people, not necessarily to reach out to God to have their prayers answered. So we're gonna look at a variety of scriptures here where people fasted so that we can get a broad reaching approach of what fasting is. There's, there's some in the Old Testament and um, in the New. But in the book of Esther, it's a short book in the Old Testament, Queen Esther was a woman who married the Babylonian king. And unbeknownst to him, she was Jewish. Um, and there were a lot of people there that didn't like the Jewish people. They were in, in exile. The Jews were faced with being slaughtered by those who manipulated the king into declaring a law that the Jewish people could be killed. So when faced with this grave situation, this is how Esther responded. And this is Esther um, chapter 4, verse 16. And this is Esther talking, and I believe she's talking to her cousin. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. 
I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. And you know, she says, even though it's against the law, even though Esther was a queen, to approach the king without being summoned for would cost her her life, literally. She could be uh, sentenced if he was in a bad mood that day, uh, because he could always just find another king, queen. Um, so she knew that if she approached him, to first of all, let him know that she was Jewish and to understand what was going on. If it didn't go well, she would die. And that's interesting. And, and later on, we're going to find out what happened. But there's also, there's also a verse in the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 35. And this time it's talking about David, 35 verses 12 and 13. They repay me evil for good and leave me like one bereaved. But yet when, I, when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. So David was faced with people that did not reciprocate his generosity, especially in terms of praying for them. Uh, when his prayers turned to him unanswered, and his prayers did seem unanswered, David is not discouraged from prayer. Because actually what he's doing is that he had prayed for them with sackcloth and ashes, and now he's praying before God. He actually turns to prayer more. Now we're skipping to Daniel, and this is in the Old Testament, and Daniel was an Old Testament prophet. But Daniel uh, was a young man when they went into exile, and he was selected along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be one of the consultants to the king. They were slaves, but they were smart, and they became, uh, for lack of better words, servants or slave leaders during the Babylonian exile. And he helped the king rule the nation he faced a lot of persecution because of that, because he was honest and forthright. And in, in his book, he describes his devotion to the Jewish people. And this is Daniel chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. And uh, he's describing uh, a situation when he goes to prayer. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and, and petition in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Now listen to what he confesses. Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Now, if you read the book of Daniel, you will find that Daniel led an exemplary life. Now, while he wasn't perfect or sinless, he did live a very devout life. Remember, when faced with the challenge of not praying, he continued to pray three times a day, was thrown into the lion's den. But even though he was uh, a devout man, he chose to humble himself before God for the sins of his people. And so when we're reading Daniel's book, especially in hindsight, we learn that Daniel's prayers were mighty. God was able to accomplish much through Daniel's humility and his desire to pray and fast. And you know, that's pretty striking. Um, many of us don't think about having to go to the throne of grace and asking God to forgive others of their sins. But Daniel did that. We also learn in Nehemiah that the people prayed and fasted for their people. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, and this is after the exile when they came back to the promised land. And starting in verse 1 of chapter 9. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and put dust in their heads. Those of the Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. Now, Listen to what they did next. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law. That's the Bible that they had at the time, which was the first five books of the Bible. They read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. So I, I would imagine that's at least three hours. And spent another quarter of the day in confession and in worshiping their God. 
So, and then they said, and then the Levites said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all the starry host, and earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. So they did a couple of things here. They, they read scripture. They spent an a huge amount of time asking forgiveness for sins of the people and uh, wanting God to do that to, on their path. And they also praised God. So they read scripture, they confessed their sin, and they praised God. There's three things going on there. And so as we jump to the New Testament, an example of fasting, and, and there we find in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38, and if you uh, remember our Bible study from the month of December, we're reading about the prophetess Anna. There was a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, and she's coming up to Jesus uh, as Joseph and Mary are carrying them. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This woman spent many, many years just fasting and praying in the temple. And another example of fasting in the New Testament is Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders that would be leaders in the church for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So we find examples of different types of where people are fasting and praying for different reasons. We live in a fallen world, and so we need all the help that we can get, sometimes even just to make it through the day. Um, I don't know that any of us can sail through any day without Something, you know, even on the, sometimes they seem apparently really good, but we never know when something's going to fall into our lap. Uh, and so God offers us that help by asking us to pray and fast. And sometimes that's hard for us to understand how praying and fasting together can do that. Uh, but these are the verses that we just went over showcase a variety of what prayer and fasting makes possible for Christians and believers. So they, the, as the, ver the Bible verses references, People fasted for different purposes, and as we see, it can lead to some dynamic answers. Praising God, um, when God allowed the Israelites to come back into the Promised Land, you know, uh, praising God opens up doors, it offers protection. He did that to the Israelites when they came back. And when we think about Esther, when she was praying and fasting, we don't know all that dynamics that went on in the spiritual world, but at least Esther was granted courage that she had done everything she could possibly do. And at that moment in time, Esther couldn't do anything more but to pray and fast. But as he granted her uh, courage, uh, she entered the king's presence with confidence. She did, and her life was spared, as well as all her other J Jewish people. And now David's prayer shows his love for his enemies. Prayer can guide our hearts much better in praying for them than seeking our retribution. And so David's example, even though that he prayed for them and they not, did not return his favor, uh, but it, it keeps our attitude right with God. It keeps our hearts humble before God. Uh, but David's example uh, teaches us that even in prayer and fasting, we cannot manipulate God. How easy would it be if we all could do is skip a couple of meals and pray and just like that, all our enemies were gone. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Um, the sentence admonishes, admonishes us and teaches us that we need to rely on God. That even though we may pray and fast for some people, what we learn is that God is sovereign and he's going to do things in his will and his time. And he's not, just because we pray and fast, we cannot dictate to God how things will happen. Our prayers do not fail because we do not, they don't fail. David didn't fail, but it did deepen his connection to God for his direction and protection. Now, Anna fasted and prayed to remember the promises of God. It had been 400 years since they had any movement at all, our prophet. And in her situation, she was praying for the coming of the Messiah. 
She didn't know the exact time, and that's not the point of committed prayer and fasting. But as she's humbled herself in servitude to prayer and fasting, God used her prayers to move mountains, not literal mountains. Those mountains were likely in the hearts of those living at that time. And it's, it, many people that day saw Jesus when he was uh, dedicated in the temple, but not many people recognized the Messiah. But there were people that did. And so there was a remnant that recognized Jesus as Messiah, the shepherds, the wise men, the early disciples. And even though Anna may not have lived to see that or even knew about it, God used her prayers to move the mental mountains that can limit how, how others can see God work. She knew and recognized God, Jesus as the Messiah in flesh, but her prayers set the attitude so that other people could recognize it too. Paul and Barnabas received wisdom and discernment to find godly people to establish his church in early days of the gospel. So too often it's easy to rely on our under, own understanding even if we are godly. In the example of Daniel in, in, in the book of Nehemiah, they both prayed and fasted for the sins of their people. We may not grasp just how important that is, but sin leaves a stain upon a group of people. Um, this verse is often quoted in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, the, the telling thing about this verse, it, it doesn't mention fasting, but it's talking about, it's not saying if, if the people that don't know Christ, the people that don't belong to God, it says if my people, if my people who are called by my name. These are people that bear the name of God. Confession and repentance begins with them. And even though Daniel was a devout man, he was committed to confessing the sins of his people through the act of prayer and fasting. His prayers were answered. But we, Dave, Daniel didn't know this, but his prayers were answered with the delay due to the spiritual battle that was going on outside of his normal human sight. God sought to answer Daniel's prayers immediately. And we find in Daniel's situation that the delay of the answer was not from God, but due to the spiritual battle that was going on. And in, in, in this verse that we're going to read, an angel appears to Daniel in a vision. Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. And the next verse we find out why. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. This verse gives us a unique glimpse into the spiritual battle that happens when we pray. We see here that the enemy doesn't want our prayers answered, but Daniel persevered. Paul writes to the Ephesians to let them know what the purpose of the church is. We see that fulfillment as, we, as Christ came, lived, died, and was resurrected and lives in heaven. We find out just how powerful our prayers are. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, God's intent, his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Paul suffered a lot, but he understood what God was doing. With Jesus Christ, he opened up the door for all believers to approach God with freedom and confidence. He, he gave us that ability for the church, and the church is us. The church is all believers, not just those who attend this church or those who go into a church building, but the church is the body of believers worldwide. And through the church, God's wisdom, his manifold wisdom, we may not always understand, 
the manifold wisdom of God. But we do learn that God's wisdom is revealed and demonstrated in the heavenly realms through the church. That is us. God's wisdom is displayed through us. And this verse points out that because of this, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. That's kind of like that verse in Hebrews, come boldly before the throne. We come boldly to his throne to pray on behalf of ourselves and those around us. Fasting involves putting our physical needs and desires on hold while we do spiritual battle in the heavenly realms. Daniel didn't understand all that was happening, but he continued to pray. His prayers broke through, and God revealed to him what was actually going on. Now this example is given to us to show that when we pray, we may not understand what is going on, but that God is demonstrating the strength of the church, that is the body of believers, individual believers, through our obedience and coming before God with our needs, requests, praises, confessions of sins and all that we do. Uh, you know, I, I, I think sometimes we, we kind of don't think about the Old Testament stories, but they really there are to help us to understand that Daniel was a devout man and he did experience a lot of spiritual pushback because he was righteous. But God showed him, not just for him, the benefit didn't just go to him, it goes to us to understand what we can do when we set our mind to pray. Fasting. One of the reasons why fasting is such a powerful tool is that our flesh is weak and it's easy to allow our flesh to direct our decisions. We, we are a body full of, uh, we have desires to eat, desires to sleep, desires to do all kinds of things and sometimes we can allow our, our human bodies to direct our decisions. But when we purposely put our physical desires on hold, and we are allowing God to work through us. We are saying we are unable to do it on our own and that God is going to have to do the work in us and through us. And just as Daniel did, we humble ourselves and we discover that in obedience, God can work his miracles in our hearts and our prayers for others. Fasting is not a magic potion. David fasted and prayed for his friends, and it didn't seem to make much of a difference, but it did help David. Fasting is not something that we can do to manipulate God. It is an act of submission and dependence on God, but it's also an act of passion, telling God that our prayerful desires are more important than our physical needs or cravings. I'm going to say that again. Fasting is an act of passion telling God that our prayerful desires are more important than our fleshly needs or cravings. We sacrifice. We make a sacrifice to God. God honors our humility many times with awesome deeds of deliverance. And he always answers with more of his presence in our lives. So I, I, I could probably do three lessons on fasting, but that's kind of the fast, fast version of fasting to kind of jumpstart us into. We'll probably talk a little bit more about fasting, but as we head into the pre-Easter time, the 40 days before Easter, next week is, the, uh, is what we call Ash Wednesday. Many people do give up something, but don't forget to give up something, but we add something, more of God's presence and his word in our life, and so we're going to talk a little bit about more about that next week. But this is our time for um, our prayer. And uh, we just need to continue to remember those who've lost loved ones. We also need to lift those up who are struggling with um, severe illness. Some of it's cancer, some of our other issues. We also just uh, continue to lift up our church as we are transitioning and looking for a new pastor. Um, and we just thankful that Pastor Jim Book is here and we need to lift him up and the other people who continue to serve our church. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your presence in our lives and your presence within our church body. We thank you for the word of God that blesses our hearts and our minds. I pray, God, that you would put that desire to read your word and understanding your word into all of our hearts and give us that wisdom and discernment to understand what it is. We thank you for the concept of fasting. And Lord, even though we are dust, as Psalm 103 says, 
you don't treat us as we deserve, but Lord, you recognize that there's many points that our bodies are so weak. But Lord, as we depend upon you and our fasting, as we depend upon you for our spiritual sustenance, you make things happen in our lives. And as we cherish that relationship with you, Lord, we saw how Jesus fasted in the desert and how Moses fasted on the mountain, that you brought about mighty things. I pray, God, that you would temper our hearts to listen to you, to listen and be obedient to what you call us to do. Lord, whether it's fasting or serving or being a good steward or something, Lord, I, I praise you that you give us that ability, that you've given us all a godly gift to use in service to each other. And so, Lord, I lift up our church to you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless our church board. Give them wisdom and discernment. And, Lord, we ask that you, your, your power of your word and confirmation will come through them as they look and seek out a new pastor for our church. I thank you, Lord, for Pastor Jim Book. Continue to enrich his life and fulfill him. Give him the word of truth to share with us. Give him the administrative acumen to, to work in our church, to keep us on target. Lord, I thank you for Pastor Lloyd Brock, too, as he leads and directs this search. Lord, I also lift up those who lost loved ones. Touch and heal their broken spirits. Lord, your word says you came to heal the broken heart, and we claim that healing in their lives. I pray that you would help them to... to Finish out all the business matters that they do, that you would give them to be at the right place at the right time that you provide for them. Help them in the days ahead, too, Lord, as they fumble around and the memories come and, and make tears, Lord, that you would just touch their hearts. Be with those who are struggling with chronic illnesses, maybe not life threatening, but chronic that causes a, a, a a loss of quality of life, Lord, I pray that you would step in and make that difference, that you would be there in the presence in their life, that you would help them to know that you're real, that you love them, that you can make make the difference in their life. So pray, Lord, that you would be with those who are struggling with cancer and serious illness, or that may be life-threatening. We pray in your peace and your presence and your healing upon them. God, can direct the medical care, provide for them financially through insurance and other means. But Lord, we praise you that you're going to work with them. And if there's anyone on our prayer list at our church that is facing uncertainty, that they don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray, God, that you would open up that door, that you would open their hearts to the truth that you have for them, for, the, for redemption and for healing. Lord God, I know that many of us have healing that we need from the brokenness, not just physical hurts, but spiritual and mental hurts. Lord, I pray that we would not neglect the healing that you have for us. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us not to accept the lies that Satan puts upon us and, and think that we're worthless, that we don't matter. Because, Lord, in your world, everyone does. You love us and you take care of us. Lord, I pray that you would be with our community. Lord, I pray that you would bring healing <clears throat> to all the hurts <clears throat> that come and demonstrate through addiction, through uh, lawlessness, Lord, that you would bring about your presence and that you would lift up the body of believers throughout our community, throughout our county, that we would pray and have a burden for our community. I pray, God, that you would press upon our hearts if there's something that we need to do in our own lives. First of all, that we need to confess our sins to you, Lord, that we confess our sins to those around us, that we would take authority in the name of Jesus, Lord, for forgiveness. And that you would open the door for healing for our church, for our, our community, for our world. Lord, I pray that you would be with our governments. Lord, you created government, and you created government, and it is <clears throat> to be good, to have order in our society. I pray, God, that you would continue to fulfill your purpose through our governments. Lord, I pray that you would raise up godly people in elected positions and in government positions and in employment positions. Bring people up to be by godly purposes. So as we pray for the peace and welfare for our communities, for our state, for our nation, Lord, that you are honored through people who establish godly principles in business and in government and interactions with each other. We praise you for that. Lord, we pray your blessings upon all that we do this week. We pray, Lord, a hedge protection around our church. We thank you for the way that you provide for us financially. 
We praise you that you're going to be in our Sunday morning service. That you're going to give travel mercies to those that come and go. We praise you and have your anointing upon all that this church does. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.